Good afternoon. We're at my favorite place on Hilton Head Island, uh, Hudson's down by the water. It always reminds me of being on vacation. I mean, we live here, yet we come down here and we look out over the water and say, God, we could be anywhere in the world. But we're, we're in Hudson's down here having lunch. I'm here today with, with, with Andrew Carmine. Uh, him and his family have owned the business since 1912. Uh, Andrew's parents, Brian and Gloria, uh, were active in the business and then Younger Andrew, like most of the younger people, take over and run the business. And Andrew was multiplied this place. They can't put the number on it all the way. Besides for here, he has the Carmine Foundation. Uh, he's a big supporter of the town with its honored uh, Islander program. And, and all around a good guy, which makes it even nicer along the way. How'd you get into this business? Well, I was born into it. I mean, my folks, uh, they bought the restaurant from the Hudson. You know, the, some of these buildings have been here since the, like you said, the teens, 19 teens. And, um, you know, the, it was an oyster pack, packing facility going back in the 20s. And so the, actually the peninsula that we're sitting on right now, the foundation is a 100% oyster shell that was part of the shucking operation. The actual bank to the creek is well in front of us here, but, um, when I, my parents bought the restaurant in 75 from the Hudson family, my dad had always wanted to be in the restaurant business. I came along in 78. In fact, my dad was working in the restaurant. Uh, my mom was, we were living in this little house uh, on the hill here, right on the property. And my mom called my dad and said, I need you to come over here. The baby's coming. You need to come and get me. We need to go to the hospital. Well, there wasn't a hospital on Hilton Head at the time. So um, my dad got his Dodge pickup truck, pulled up to the house and said, jump in. They, they got all the way to the base of the Paris Island Bridge and my mom said, we're not gonna make it. So my dad delivered me on the front seat of the oh. Dodge pickup truck. As the story goes, the, um, my mom tells it this way. She says that the police escort came, they rushed everybody to the hospital and my dad was so freaked out that they took my dad and me into the hospital and left my mom in a wheelchair <laughs> in the rain. I don't know how true that is, but as I, as I get older, I realize that what I thought were embellishments are more, more often than not true. So, um, but anyway, I, my experience in the restaurant business, I started, um, it really started as a punishment for me. You know, I, if I didn't do my homework or I lied about doing my homework, um, I would be picking up cigarette butts in the parking lot and graduated to cleaning bathrooms and then ultimately developed enough trust to where I checked in some shrimp deliveries and I kind of fell in love with that side of the business. You did a news story one time where you went out with the shrimping boats overnight. Yeah. Could you talk about that story? That's, it always interested me, that story. Yeah, I mean, well, so it's no, it was no stranger. I was no stranger to that growing up. But, you know, my uncle, Stephen Shoemaker, um, he had the Jason, which was a, a boat that docked here. And so when I grew when I was growing up, I used to go out with them. And um, I remember one time in particular, I went out with my uncle. And it's a tough job. Uh, commercial shrimping, um, you know, a lot of times it's in the middle of the summer, and so it's 95 plus degrees on the boat, and you're out in the sun heading shrimp and sorting through bycatch, and it's a tough job. My first time going, I remember my appetite was not great because I was, we were rocking and rolling all the time, and it was not enhanced. It was actually uh, the opposite of enhanced when uh, the strikers on the boat told me that we were eating fried seagull when it was in fact fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't eat much that night. But um, yeah, some really great experiences growing up and um, I think it kind of uh, made me a little bit more, have a better understanding of what I find to be important in the business and, and what I see as uh, as valuable. When you bought this place, when you look around, you come here a lot, you see the same people working here. Yeah. Which is a rarity today on our island. Yeah. But you have the same crew, they here over and over and over. And I understand even when the hurricanes hit, they came back and worked for you doing to repair the place and everything. Yeah, that was one of the most, um, uh, I don't know, um, heartwarming and just, it was an amazing series of events. And I've always kind of, I've always kind of prided myself on decision-making when it's extremely critical. Um, we had Hurricane Matthew destroyed the restaurant. I came back 
um, I got back early. I got a DNR escort to bring me back over the bridges and um, just saw the devastation. And I knew the first thing I thought of was not, you know, what's going to happen to Hudson's. The first thing I thought of was what's going to happen to our 150 employees that, you know, some of them regrettably are living paycheck to paycheck. Some of them have kids that are in school. Um, they're affording, you know, high, high priced uh, real estate and renting these properties. And are they going to be OK? And I started to think about it. And, I, and I, when I had my initial meeting with a contractor, I said, how long is it till you can get us open? And they said three and a half to four months. And I said, well, that's not going to work for me because I have 150 employees that need to come to work. So I hatched a plan. I had all the employees come back. When they were able to come back to the island, I had a full staff meeting. And about 95 of 120 employees showed up. And I said, here's the deal. I said, we can do it together. And I can pay you $20 an hour until we get the place put back together and get reopened. Or you can go find other work and collect un and or collect unemployment until we get open four months from now. And they, every single one of them jumped on board. And we worked 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. every night, had a big family meal every day at lunch. And we got this place reopened in two and a half, three weeks. It was pretty incredible. And, and when you think about it, I mean, really what these, you've got a group of contractors, you've got four or five guys that are trying to move all this equipment in and out. Right. And we had 120 people doing the work. So they were able to focus on the nuanced trade work and we were able to do the grunt work and the stuff that nobody wanted to do. So, so it really opened my eyes to kind of, you know, the power of a team and it made us much stronger as a result. And I think what you said about having the same people for years, when I started here in 2006 as an entry level manager, you know, a lot of the people that were here at the time weren't my people and they didn't really want me here. And, you know, that's just a, a cultural thing. And I think once we realize, once I realized that, you know, life's too short and that you need to have people around you that you enjoy being with, we started hiring nice people and teaching them how to do this job, as opposed to trying to hire people with lots of experience that maybe were jaded or had bad habits. And still to this day, and I, I don't mean this as a detraction from the employees that we have that are, you know, people that we've hired in the last several years, but the best people that we have are the people that started here when they were 15 or 16 years old, and they started in an entry level position, and they learned how we do things. And, and um, we have great employees across the board, but those people are always the ones that our customers say, that's the best server I've ever had. Hey, all your servers treat their customers like they're the best people in the world, but all your employees believe they act like it's their place. Yeah. Like it's their home. And the customers do too. That's right. And I like that and I appreciate that. And, you know, one of our hostesses said to me, oh, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but occasionally I do favors for customers. You know, if they have family in town, they call me or text me and say, hey, I got my family coming in town. Is there any way you can help us get a table? And I say, sure. Um, you know, membership has its privileges, that kind of thing. Well, one of my hosts one time said to me, doesn't it get old when people text you and ask you for a table? And I say, you know, I don't look at it that way. I look at it like they really, really want to be here and they're paying your salary. They're paying my salary. They're helping us be able to do great things in the community. So yeah, am, am I willing to respond to a text message and forward it on? Absolutely. I think that's a small ask given what sure the success that we've had. Yeah. But when you look around, you can see not only the same service, but the same people eating here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I tell you, right when, when Labor Day comes around, it's like flipping a switch. We go from mostly visitors to I know somebody at every single table in the restaurant. And I think that's kind of a testament to um, the way that we treat people. Besides for the staff that you have now for a long time, how do you get new people through the staff that you have? Oh man, new people's tough. But I'll tell you a funny story, and I won't say his name because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but um, just the other day, we, I was walking around the deck and a good friend that I've known for a really, really long time that just sold his business on the island, uh, he sold it last year, and I said, what are you doing now? I know you're not retired because I know that you go, 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 and there's no way you're gonna enjoy retirement. And he said, you know, it's time for me to do something. And I said, well, what are you thinking about doing? And he said, I don't know, waiting tables, bartending a couple days a week. I said, you're welcome to work here. And he couldn't believe that I said that. And he said, are you serious or are you just being nice? And I said, no. 
I said, I'd love to have you, man. You know so many people and you'd fit in great here, just the way that you interact with people. I mean, it would be a great fit. And you know, it's a really great compliment to, to, to me that he would want to work sure. here because you know, there's ego involved when, you own, when you're a business owner and, and going to work for another business owner, you know, sometimes there's ego involved. So I was really touched that he, he wanted to do that. So he is, I guess, starting next week, which is great. But that's not the norm. We, normally we're scrapping for people. I mean, we really have to struggle to, to get people. And, and the way that we do it is tricky too, because if, if somebody doesn't fit in, we don't keep them. Right. You know, we just, it's not like, again, life's too short. And, you know, one, one bad apple can spoil the bunch. So if we onboard somebody and we realize day two that maybe it's not a good fit, we'll have a conversation with them and say, hey, is this the norm or is this just, are you having a bad week? But um, so, yeah, I mean, it's really challenging to get those ones that stick, especially in the current climate. But like I always say, we've got the right kind of problems, man. Right, right, right. Tell us about the foundation you have. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, so my brother, uh, my parents, my brother uh, lost a long fight with cancer in 2002. And my parents have always been the kind of people that um, always, my dad especially, always try to turn something negative into something positive. So when he passed away, they started a foundation um, to raise money for various nonprofits. And they had a little fundraiser that they did at the restaurant. And the first year was 300 people. The second year was 400 people. In 2006, we, it was my first year back, we moved it to the new old Shelter Cove Community Park. And the park swallowed the event. And I was super embarrassed. I was pretty mortified. I mean, it was just seeing this whole giant park and these little group of people. And so we knew we needed to do something. So we pivoted and rebranded at the Hilton Head Island Seafood Festival. And, and since then, we've uh, donated uh, $1.2 million to local nonprofits. And those include after school programs at the rec center for kids that's parents can't pick them up. Uh, preschool programs for parents that can't afford preschool programs, um, uh, volunteers in medicines, one of the beneficiaries, um, Mitchellville Project, we've given some money to this year, um, Coastal Conservation League, because without this, we have nothing. Without these natural resources, we have no tourism, we have no development, we have no business, nothing. So uh, Coastal Conservation League, Port Royal Sound Foundation, um, because anything that I can do and our family can do to make Hilton Head a better place to live and work, um, if I, I mean, the, the, having the ability to do that is, is a blessing and something that I don't take lightly. Talk about doing something lightly and doing it very, very thorough and everybody loves it, is your Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, yeah. I understand there's a waiting list just to work here. That's true. Just to be a server. That's true. Yeah, we've, my parents, my dad and the Laco family started that, oh boy, I don't even know the year, but it's been going on for over 20 years. Um, they just saw a need in the community for somewhere for uh, people to go, you know, widows, um, people that were down on their luck. But they never build it as something for people that were in need. Uh, because they thought that people would be uh, hesitant to attend. And that was the best thing they ever did. Because um, now you see people pull up in Rolls Royces and Bentleys, and you see people come up in on bikes. You see people walking from their neighborhood down the road. And um, they eat family style for free with whoever they're standing in line with. So it truly encapsulates the nature of community. And I wouldn't, uh, I can't imagine Thanksgiving without it. Actually, my oldest daughter is old enough finally to volunteer this year. So she's going to be helping me out in the kitchen. Is there really a waiting list of helpers, people? Yes. Really? Every year. Every year. In fact, every year I have somebody come up to me and say, hey, I can't volunteer through the church. Can, can I come and help you in the kitchen? And I say, yeah, come on, come help me in the kitchen. How many volunteers do you get? I think this year we had 360. Volunteers. Yeah. And we served 1,600 people. Just amazing. Yeah, and then uh, Hudson's people, like my people. I, last year I had 42 Hudson's people that volunteered, and I didn't even ask them. Yeah. Which I think is pretty awesome. Well, it just um, you can, no words for it. There's no absolutely yeah, no words. Yeah, it's neat. It's a good, good, fest, good little event, and we 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 love doing it. And the Laco family and all the other supporters from St. Andrew's Church, and it's just uh, it's a really special day. So you know. 
Even if you don't have an opportunity to volunteer, you're welcome to come and eat and leave a donation. It's something that every Islander should experience at least once, I think. What are you gonna do with this area here we're sitting at now? Are you gonna develop it or? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the answer to this concrete pad that we're on right now is to create a similar dock to what we have over here and do it on piling. So right. as we deal with tide inundation, um, we have a structure that's there and there for generations. I think that's the plan anyway. And we've got some plans to do that. It's sort of, we're sort of phasing everything out now. We've got an architect that we're working with and. You're not gonna go up on a second story. Eventually, yeah. Second story and this here. Yeah, we don't have a choice. Eventually, we'll have to go up a second story, I think, unfortunately. But this year has been great. I mean, this year, we this fall has been the most mild with regards to the tides that we've had in the last five, six years. So, you know, they do say certain things like that are cyclical. So maybe we're in a, in a different trend. But I think it's, you know, if you're looking at the next 50 years, I think it's something that we're going to have to very seriously address. And I don't want to leave it to my children to to have to do that or so it, it's something that's going to fall on my shoulders and something that I'm not really looking forward to and but the plan is to do it in a way that we can retain our employees and um, and do it in phases where we're not disrupting the business entirely speaking of children and employees how are your parents they're amazing uh, my mom and dad spent uh, the whole month of September in Montana Whoa. and um, they came back per usual from Montana looking 10 years younger you know, I think um, for them, it's just nice to be able to get away and be somewhere else where, you know, uh, they can be anonymous for a while. You know, I think um, they really enjoy just kind of disconnecting for a period. And I, and I get that. And I'm so glad that um, they deserve it. They earned it more than most people. So first time I met your father about 10, 15 years ago, we had lunch right inside there. And I went outside and I said, it's three o'clock. We had lunch about 1130. It was just a, an easy person to talk to. It's always easy being an outsider and being in the sun. I understand that. Yeah. But he's just an easy man to sit down and chat with about everything in the world, from baseball to, uh, to all that stuff. He's a very well-read guy. I mean, uh, there's very few people that have more information up there than, than he does. And I have uh, learned so much from him. And I think the big thing that he taught me and my brother as a kid is that and just not by saying it, but by doing it was, you know, he was always involved, always doing something to help, uh, whether it was setting up the rec center or whether it was doing the rotary stuff that he did. He, it wasn't if you participated and if you got involved, it was how. Yeah. And he led by example in that regard. And um, I'm so glad that he did because some of the most enriching parts of my life to this day are those involvements that I have that probably I wouldn't have been as involved if it weren't for his example. So it's pretty incredible. Um, just, uh, and it's obvious to me when, when I'm out in the community, just how many people ask how he's doing and um, how my mom's doing. And so- Your mother's still working out? Oh yeah, every day, every day. I used to hear her all the time in Beach City when we were all over there, yeah. She's like me, you know, if I don't get my exercise in the morning, I'm a mess. I mean, I, I, I need to get some of that extra energy out before I get on with my day. So, but she's, uh, she's a fireball and she's always going and she loves those grandkids. So. Well, you've been, you've been a great citizen here, a great entrepreneur here, and I'm really glad we had this time together. Yeah, me I too. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for your service, thank too. Thank you.